where we're at and one uh, where I want to be, um, <laughs> courtesy of John. And so now um, this presentation is about trends in law libraries, where we're going. And our two presenters cover both legal academia and law firm libraries. This time I'll have a chance to properly introduce you. Um, are you going to go first? Yes. Okay. June Liebert is the firm-wide library director, as, as you had heard, from Sidley Austin LLP. And she's going to speak on, obviously, trends in law for libraries. And uh, she uh, formerly was library director and assistant professor of law at John Marshall Law School, also in Chicago. And June also was director of Internet Initiatives at the University of Texas Law Library, uh, amongst her prior jobs. Um, she's won the Kenneth J. Hirsch Distinguished Service Award from the AAL Competing Services SIS and has been a CS SIS board member and then president as well. And, and uh, uh, so June will be the first one to speak, and then she'll be followed up by Kincaid Brown, Assistant Director and Head of Scholarly Publishing and Electronic Services at the University of Michigan Law Library. Kincaid's library degree and JD degree are both from the University of Michigan, and Kincaid is responsible for the library's website, management system, electronic resources management, electronic service, oversees the acquisitions and cataloging services unit, and coordinates with the law school IT department. He's the vice chair of the AAL Computer uh, Services SIS and has been on its executive board and has chaired the Communications Committee and also the Emerging Technology Subcommittee of CSSIS. He's also uh, been heavily involved in the Cool Tools Cafe at the annual AAAL conferences, and he's uh, been at his alma mater since 1998. And uh, following June, uh, he will obviously speak on trends in academic law libraries. Take it away, June. <laughs> traditional presentation, and the reason is because um, I've been kind of on the road, <laughs> and so, um, and this gives you an idea as to how crazy my mind is. I go in a million different directions, and so for me, I use a lot of mind maps because it allows me to kind of um, keep a lot of different ideas together, but then I can group them differently depending on how I see it that day. So that's what you're looking at is um, this kind of mind map brain dump <laughs> of things I've thought about over the last couple of weeks. So um, I thought I would start with um, what I've actually been doing. You know, I, so I've been at Sidley for a year now, and just over a year, and um, I thought, gosh, you know, I have kind of this, what is it that I do all day long? Uh -huh. you know, I just share that with you a little bit because I think you'd find it interesting. You know, so that's what the, my schedule is. So I've actually been on the road, <laughs> um, starting with um, on the, earlier this week, I was actually in Texas. I was uh, visiting our Dallas office, and then what I did there was I actually met with the, um, the associates. So it's a smaller office we have, I think about 50 attorneys there, and um, the associates, um, we don't have a library locally there. And so um, they had a lot of questions. So that's what I was doing. And I sat there and we chatted. Um, and they, they, they thought it was great that somebody you know, came from the library just to talk to them. Um, and then on, uh, that, was, uh, that was in Houston, actually. And then I also was in Dallas, where I sat down with a bunch of partners. And we talked about um, how they're doing business development. You know, how are they getting new clients? Because uh, much of what I'm doing in my job is trying to understand how people do their jobs so that we can, uh, we can understand how to help them better. So it was a fascinating conversation about what they're trying to do in order to get new clients. It's a really big challenge um, for firms. Um, I was invited to the litigation partners meeting. So I landed in Chicago Wednesday night. <laughs> On Thursday morning, I had... Um, of that presentation with litigation partners. They gave me only like five or ten minutes. But you know what I talked about? I talked about news curation. 
and how and this is about identifying what it is that people are having difficulty with, right? And I think for partners, aside from the business development stuff, one of their challenges is they're getting overwhelmed with emails. They are drowning in emails. And I hear this over and over and over. Oh my God, I, you know, yeah, I get those I get those e-newsletters, but I never read them because I never have time. It's like, well, I'm spending millions of dollars on them. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the whole talk that I gave, all five, ten minutes of it, was focused on how the library can help you curate and better target your news needs so that you don't have to sit there and read every single thing that comes through. Um, and I think they really appreciate that because they kind of went, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, the other thing I did on um, that same morning, I had a big meeting about knowledge management, so I was just talking to Leanne here. Uh, in law firms, knowledge management is a big deal. Everybody wants to do it. Um, I don't know that anyone's really doing it super well. But the idea is to kind of capture the knowledge that already exists. So in a law school context, and I'm sorry, you should have asked this right off the bat. How many of you are from a law school? And how many are you from a law firm? Oh, great. And how many of you from a county court, some sort of other library? It's great. Okay, so pipe up. That's a great thing about having this kind of presentation. You know, I can jump wherever you want to go. So if I'm starting to bore you, just say, hey, can we talk about this instead? Um, so um, KM is probably one of the biggest things right now. And, you know, historically, because I am the very first firm line library director at Sidley, uh, we've not really, in the library, we've not really done a lot in terms of KM because I think they were really focused just on getting the day-to-day -day research requests done. So um, the great thing about me is, I don't do that all day long, so I have time to go around and talk to people and find out what they need, and that's a great job. Um, so part of what I'm doing is kind of talking to people, and um, KM is one of those ideas, that, you know, can you capture what it is that's in everyone's heads and share it with other people easily in order to save time? This is all about efficiency at the end. So imagine in a law school context, and I tried this out on some of my law school friends and they kind of rolled their eyes, but in a law school context, if you've got a professor who's amazing, an amazing teacher, um, he's you know, 80 years old, he's about to retire, what have you done to capture what he knows? You know, what makes him an amazing teacher? Have we ever asked that? And what about what he learned putting together his syllabus or his, you know, his quizzes, his tests. Did we capture that? And then are we sharing that with the new person who just came in the door last year, who's trying to, to write, etc.? You know, how are we doing that? In a law firm side, same thing. We've got an amazing litigator. I've got one on my, I've got a great um, transactional guy on my floor who's a former chair of the firm, teaches at the University of Chicago. I think right now he's flying out to Harvard to teach. Um, what do we do to capture what's in his head? And what's great about him is he's really dedicated to sharing information. And so what he's done is he's taken some of his forms and he's actually taken the time to actually um, annotate them, to explain to people, this is why I did this. If you're in this situation, you need to do that. That's what we need. Now, the problem is, of course, nobody has time. In a firm, nobody has time. Nobody wants to make time. It's not a billable thing. So these are very big challenges that we have. Um, you know, IT, they're great. We have a very good IT group, you know, but they're not really, they don't deal with the lawyers day to day. They don't really understand what the lawyers are doing. They're, again, worried about making sure that all the equipment is running <laughs> and that we don't get hacked. Right? Those are their worries. They're not concerned about can we get what's in this partner's head into the new associate's head. They're not concerned. So this is a great role for libraries, and this is why you know I'm involved in this meeting, and so that was that was my other meeting. Um, and I got a plane and came here. <laughs> Next week, I am actually going to our annual partners meeting. So there's one every year. Um, every partner in the firm globally comes, and um, 
we are actually, for the first time, the library is going to have a presence. We're going to have a table, and we are going to help people install research apps. But because of our lovely security problems, <laughs> I can't just create a guide and have them, you know, go to it. I have to actually create a sheet of paper. So we've done this thing where we've now created a sheet of paper. We're actually going, we put a QR code on it. And so we're just going to install a QR code reader. We're going to scan the sheet of paper, and we're going to give them all these apps right there at the table. So these are the kinds of things um, that we're doing. Um, the week after that, two weeks after that, I'm actually on an advisory board for a vendor. Not yours, Ben, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to Miami for a week, and we're going to talk about what new products this vendor is working on, and what do I think about that, and what are my ideas? And I love this, you know, that a vendor is willing, and all vendors, your vendor does do that, your vendor does do that. Um, all vendors do this. It's about having a voice, and I think that's one of the things Leanna and I were just talking about, is about having a voice in the process. You know, raise your hand, just do it. Um, invite yourself to these meetings, if you can. <laughs> all right, so. I've done nothing this on the rest of my sheet here, but just real quickly. Um, so in the green blobs, green blobs are all about business. You know, what are the challenges law firms have right now? It's all about pricing. Um, you know, even at a firm like Sidley, we're we're making we're doing okay. <laughs> um, that you know we're still very sensitive to pricing efficiency. Um, you know, our biggest competition, corporate counsel. These in-house lawyers, they're growing. Um, they're probably the biggest competition right now for, for law firms. And, um, you know, these are all globalization. There's less associates. I'm seeing a lot fewer associates coming in the door. Sorry, law schools. We're hiring far fewer law associates right out of law school. What I am seeing is a lot of laterals coming in. So, um, yeah, so these are all things that are happening. Now, the challenges from a library perspective are, you know, space. That's a big one. It's the second highest cost of any law firm, um, especially if you're in New York. <laughs> and I will add, my library is in the basement. They call it the concourse. <laughs> it's across from the indoor swimming pool. It is great. <laughs> um, but that happened because of 9-11, because they were supposed to move into a new building. 9-11 happened. The building was no longer there, so they kind of got shoved back into the old building, and the only place left was the basement. So, um, so there's a reason for that. But um, this is something that's really big. The lawyers only spend. Um, most of the lawyers are not actually in their offices. They travel a lot. We do a lot of hoteling. So there, you know, even I, when I travel, um, I can easily get an office like that wherever I'm going. They, sign me, they send me um, an email that tells me exactly where my office is, what my phone number is. When I walk in the door, no matter what city I'm in, my ID works. Um, so it's a really, they're used to that because the lawyers do this. They, they're constantly moving around. Um, they're working virtually as a result. The library, we work very virtually as a team. This is a new skill that um, I think that, again, in a law school, unless you have multiple campuses, um, you don't really think about because uh, you're all in one place. But for us, it's a challenge because I've, you know, I've got a lot of different libraries. I've got a bunch of people trying to provide one cohesive service um, across a lot of different time zones with a lot of different skill sets. So it's, it's been interesting. Um, competitors, we have a lot of competitors in law firms. And I'll tell you, number one on that list is marketing. And um, they're good at selling themselves, right? That's what they do for a living. They're really good at it. Um, and this is where I'm seeing law, law firm librarians are losing a lot of ground. Because in that business intelligence field, um, for whatever reason, it's not billable. So there's been a real reluctance, I think, um, to take on that kind of work. But the problem is, this is the growth area, right? You get even one multi-million dollar client out of whatever work that you just did, you are golden. I had a partner say that to me. He said, if you give me one of these kinds of things, I will pay for all your books next year. OK. <laughs> That's insane. Um, so, you know, competitors, we have a lot of competitors. Everyone's just kind of trying to inch in. And it's about trying to figure out what it is that we are really good at 
that no one else can do. Business intelligence, to me, that's kind of a no-brainer. We should be doing that. Even on the law school side, you know, um, my husband does this too. It's like he's always looking at what the competition is doing in law schools. It's always very interesting. Um, and then finally is the opportunity. Oh, measuring value, very, very hard. So are you taking that time? Um, so you're doing all this great stuff. When do you stop and say, all right, are we being successful doing this? You know, when I was in law school, one of the things that I did was I started putting together an annual report, and I thought, well, I could sit here and say, well, we, we answer 90,000 reference questions, but who really cares, right? Like, I put that number in, what does that really mean? It doesn't mean anything to the, the dean. The number that means something, though, is what has the effect been that we've had on the professor's ability to write. So, you know, I was able to show, because we track everything that we did in the library, um, I was able to show that we actually worked on 89% of the published articles by the faculty that year. So, you know, you have to find numbers that mean something, that show value. Um, and then, finally, in the yellow blob here, <laughs> we have a lot of opportunities. So I've talked about a lot of these already. Um, knowledge management is, again, big growth area. If you think about what is it that we're good at, we're good at organizing stuff. Sometimes it's pieces of paper, but sometimes it's information that's in the air. We're good at organizing all of it. And not only can we organize it, but we can then give it back to people in a way that makes sense because we know how people consume information. Um, same thing with big data, you know, it's all about, you know, I always think of librarians as um, people who are able to take anything, literally anything, and make sense of it by organizing it in ways that other people can understand. So if you use that kind of really broad explanation of what a library could be, that's pretty broad. You could do almost anything with that. So. Um, space management, this is a big deal in <laughs> law firms again. Um, we are getting you know, less and less space. Um, I guess my worry about the hologram is that we will no longer, we will all be stuck in a basement. And not just in any basement, but a basement in Wheeling, West Virginia. Nothing gets in West Virginia. <laughs> but, um, but that's what's happening in law firms, because that square footage that even a librarian is sitting in is costing the firm a lot of money. And so if I can, you know, it's scary. And actually, it kind of scared me a little as we were talking, John, because I thought, oh, my God, then we'll be in Siberia next, you know. <laughs> but, hey, there'll be a hologram of me in the meeting. <laughs> um, so, you know, these are things we have to think about. It's like, what's the value of having a librarian in that space? Um, that's an argument I'm having right now. It's like, hey, my librarians never see people in New York because they're in the basement. So I have to figure out, you know, what's the reason why it makes sense for them to come out of that space. Now, right now, they're tied to the space because of the books. Do they really need the books? Not really. 90% of what's in that collection is online. So we have to figure out how to transition. And we're transitioning by moving, trying to move more people to e-books, which I see as a very transitional product. You know, it's, a, it's not quite as scary as online, but... Um, it has many of the same features. You can still flip the page, sort of. Um, so these are the kinds of things you can work on. Um, let's see. I think I talked about just about everything. Resource management, um, contract negotiations, big deal in law firms. Um, the, the dollar numbers that I'm seeing have just been eye-opening. <laughs> Having been used to law school pricing, uh, law firm pricing has been completely a whole other animal. And um, the you know and, and and I think for law school people I mean I I, I mean I think I paid more for one user license than you pay for your entire Westlaw contract annually um, for one person actually twice as much for one person than your lots of Westlaw contract so you know just think about the amount of money involved here and the question is you know how do we make the best use of that that is. You know, part of what the law firm librarian does all the time. Um, we use uh, a lot of usage tracking. So again, um, I have become 
uh, research monitor is what we just installed, has become my new best friend. <laughs> because I get all sorts of reports showing me, yes, user X may say that he really, really needs this thing that costs $50,000. But when I look online, I can see, hmm, you know, it doesn't look like you've logged in more than three times in the last year. Are you sure you really need that? Um, you know, because people's perception of how they use things is very different than the reality. So, um, so again, another very important role, and the use of technology is helping us do that. I'm also then taking that same statistic, running it through a product called Tableau, which allows me to visualize the data differently. So, um, I've been doing things like taking uh, my research statistics, running it through Tableau, and I can see that, gosh, you know, all the vast majority of the questions are being answered by, I think like half the questions were being answered by like a fourth of the staff. Um, or something like um, in one location, I've got a whole bunch of little tiny boxes, which means that I don't have any one big user, which I have to question, why is that? Because in all the other cities, I have a couple different good users. So again, technology, when used correctly, um, can be a very valuable tool. So I could go on and on because there's a whole lot of stuff here, but <laughs> I'm sure Casey would like to get a chance of this. So thank you all very much. So I'm going to rock it old school and not have slides at all. Um, and so I'm also uh, going to sort of, technology is going to be part of what I'm talking about, but I'm also going to talk more broadly than that. Um, and so if you've been breathing or reading above the law over the last, you know, half dozen years, you know that this is a time of great unhappiness with the legal education system. And so some of the unhappy folks are the students because they've got lots of debt and there's fewer jobs out there. Um, many grads are unemployed and quoting the blues and saying, I've made a huge mistake. Um, and firms are unhappy with graduate practical skill set. Um, a lot of I always say kids, but they're adults. <laughs> a lot of people are coming out of law schools without, you know, a lot of practical skills with legal research, legal analysis, things of that nature. Um, clients won't pay anymore for new new lawyers to 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 work on projects. Um, so this had, you know, has gotten the ABA worried. Last year, they revised a, a number of uh, their standards dealing with law schools. Um, so just uh, to quote, previously, uh, students would receive substantial instruction in substantive law and legal skills, and now schools need to establish learning outcomes that include competency in those same areas. And so the people in the ed school call this outcome, outcomes-based education. Um, so linking the curriculum to specific um, to specific results that you want. Um, and this allows for better assessment of the students and the progress that they're making, um, uh, you know, because you're measuring to specific outcomes. Um, so this is affecting the law schools, obviously. There's fewer students going to law school now um, because there's fewer jobs. Uh, LSAT applications have gone down 34% from 2010 to 2014. So that's 34% fewer people paying tuition at law schools across the country. And so with fewer students, there's less money uh, to go around. So budgets are being cut. Uh, the students that are in law school are panicked because of the debt, because of the you know, fewer jobs. And then recently, you know, there's a lot of news this last year about the lower bar passage rates. So the people that are, are going to law school aren't, you know, being able to practice at the, at the same percentage. And all of those things affect the holy grail of the U.S. News and World Report ranking. <laughs> um, okay, so law schools are reacting. Uh, they're trying to give more practical school practical skills to the students. So new courses, revamped courses, new programs, new centers, more clinics. Um, they're looking for new revenue lines. 
online courses, uh, more graduate students, summer programs, and then there's some law schools that are lowering admission standards uh, to, to keep the numbers the same. Um, you know, but that's gotten a lot of bad PR recently with the, with the declining bar passage rate. <laughs> Um, and then, obviously, law schools are looking for cuts. Um, you know, you get the most by cutting staff, uh, but, you know, so the staff, you know, non-tenure track faculty, um, what, they got to keep their U.S. News ranking high, so the, so the student-to-faculty ratio has to be the same, so it's the people that don't count toward the, the student-to-faculty ratio that, you know, are, are going. Um, and so they got to keep the spend on the students high for the U.S. News and World Report, and they got to keep the scores coming in at the same level. Um, you know, so uh, so that's where we are. Uh, you know, and then the law schools are trickling down the changes to the libraries, uh, flat or reduced budgets, and increased oversight. Um, back in the early 2000s, a lot of academic libraries had a great deal of autonomy to just you know, stay the course and do, do what you do. Um, but now deans are paying attention. Uh, libraries are a black hole of spending, um, you know, with these big build, big space allocations that are just used to store books because nobody uses books anymore. Um, and then legal, you know, and everybody in the room knows about the changes in the legal publishing. E is not the panacea that we thought it was going to be in the, in the 90s. Um, of lower costs. Um, you know, our inflation is rampant, which is difficult with, you know, stagnant or, or reduced budgets. Um, that's just all common sense. Okay, so so that's where we are. And so now, like, what are we doing and how are we going forward? And so there's sort of four trends that all intertwine, but I'm sort of grouping them into four different categories. And so the first one is assessment with the flip, with the coin flip of responsiveness. Um, so uh, June Mitch talked about this a little bit. You know, a lot of assessment we're talking about is numbers, um, but numbers, obviously, as everyone in the room knows, don't tell the whole story. Um, and so you have to, you know, this this is true in any sort of walk of life. It's not just true of law libraries, but you have to prove your return on investment. Um, and so that's where the academic libraries are now, in that they got to, you know, we have to prove our worth in a way that maybe we didn't used to have to. Um, and so, you know, everybody likes to look at numbers because numbers are easy to look at. That's the evil genius of the U.S. News World Report. The schools in '83, obviously, they're way better than the school that's in '82. Um, but you know, but it's not. You know, it's just not the same. Um, and, you know, but there's obviously more to, to a story than, than, than just the numbers. And so the schools, the law libraries are big into self-assessment these days. Obviously the budget, that's, that's the huge one, because uh, that's, the, that's the bottom line. Um, you know, a lot of weighing this versus that. You know, we're at a time where sort of the big three platforms are, t you know, that's 10% of our collection budget. There's going to be, and maybe there already is, and I just haven't heard, but there's going to be an academic law library that says, well, we, we just can't support the big three anymore. we gotta, we got to drop one. And so I'm not sure. It, it'll depend library to library which, which one that will be, but it's got to be, it's got to happen sometime, sometime in the next five to ten years, I would think, and probably you know, sooner than that. Um, there's a constant review of library staffing technology services and procedures. Um, what can we stop doing? What can we do more efficiently? Uh, staff are retiring and resigning all the time. Do we need to replace that person doing that job? Do we need to, do we need that body at all? Or maybe we need that body to do something else. Um, and then, we need just greater efficiency of doing jobs um, because we just have fewer staff, period. Uh, so, I mean, this last year, we just canceled tons and tons and tons of our loose leaves because we just we can't afford to have people file them anymore. Um, and then, you know, we're obviously always looking for new technologies to do things 
that we had been doing by hand or that we, um, you know, or new services that we, that we wanted to. Um, and then there's a need, and so the flip side of assessment is responsiveness. Um, and so obviously, the, you know, the easy one is the collection, you know, people request some things, so you gotta, so, you know, you wanna give the, the people what they want, but you gotta cancel something, you know, to give them that. Um, you know, so it's paying attention to what the faculty and the students and the administration want. Uh, so the number one thing the students want at our library is quiet. Keep out the undergrads and the business students and other undesirables. And so, you know, and so if we do that, you know, that, that, that helps us, okay? That helps our perception. Um, you know, and, and just the services that we provide, how do they, how do they want to provide it? Um, does anybody use webinars anymore? Or, um, or do they just want to chat and not come to the physical reference desk? Um, and then a lot of libraries are trying to stay relevant in the larger law schools by taking on non-traditional library functions. Um, so, a lot of libraries are taking on the journals and law school publications. Yeah, that makes sense, especially you know now that a lot of these things are going to be e-only. Uh, you know, and then a lot of libraries are taking on some student services, some facilities things. Um, our library is now the call center for the entire law school. Um, you know, and so it's staying relevant, being part of the team, and sh you know trying to always you know uh, show your worth. So, so keeping on with the responsiveness, um, but I'm, this is my trend number two, and so that's new services and outreach. Um, and I, I think of all services and outreach as sort of a continuum. Some things are more services with less outreach, and some things are more outreach with some service in it. Um, and so one big uh, thing that a lot of uh, academic law libraries are doing because it's relatively inexpensive is some non-traditional student services. So things like therapy dogs, coffee, relaxation rooms, massages, things of that nature. <laughs> the students, you got to keep the students happy because that's the bottom line of the U.S. News and World Report ranking. Um, they can't, you know, you can't be having tons and tons of students transfer. Um, so you want to and the, and the administration doesn't want to hear students complaining. So you, you try and do whatever you can to, to make, this, make the students happy. Um, and then sort of another big one uh, that, um, uh, Brent talked about earlier is, um, you know, ex uh, content creation. So uh, ex especially with things like, it, institutional repositories and other online content. Um, you know, so it's expanded new e-content uh, content that you're sort of publishing on the web, um, but if you're, if we're talking about an institutional repository with faculty scholarship, it's, uh, it's also a service to the faculty because it increases the exposure. Um, studies have shown that if things are open access, for every two sites the work gets, you get a third one if it's open access. Um, you know, and so that's good for the school, that's good for the faculty. Every month when they get those download reports from BE Press Digital Commons that shows how much more, access, how, much, how many more downloads they're getting in the IR than they ever used to get on SSRN, you know, that's good PR for the library. Um, faculty bibliographies, I've heard of an, U of M has been doing effective bibliography for years and years and years, but many more libraries are now doing them too. Part of that is again, it's good for you know faculty exposure, um, but also you know the ABA is always asking for lists of what your faculty has written. Um, and believe it or not, faculty are not always so good at remembering the things that they've written. And so if we you know if we just do it on a continual basis, then we can lickety split make that report to give to the dean, to give to the ABA, and everybody's happy. Um, digitization projects outside of sort of content creation in the sense of uh, scanning. 
you know, there's the Google Books Project. A lot of libraries are scanning rare books and special collections. Um, and then there's sort of academic library sort of government partnerships, like Rutgers has a great um, digitization project of New Jersey state documents, um, you know, that whenever I use, whenever I have to do New Jersey research, research I always use. Um, and then just a lot of something um, that a lot of law li academic law libraries are doing is sort of trying to fill the role of um, in some sort of technical training areas because you know IT is being squeezed too, um, and so especially with mobile tech, cloud computing, things of that nature, librarians or uh, academic librarians are stepping in to um, to provide training for. Uh, to the to the students, um, and just you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, embedded librarians. Um, you know, s librarians are you know participating in clinics and doctrinal courses. Um, you know, to try and give the re a research, um, you know, to help with the analysis and the research and the practical skills. Uh, um, and then, uh, but for special events too. Um, you know, the, one of the big worries, as I mentioned before, is finding a job. And so something that we did last year was we embedded an OCI on campus interviewing, it's probably a different acronym anywhere, to help uh, students find information about the firms and the attorneys that they're, that they're interviewing with. We didn't get that many takers, but I think it made them feel better to know that we were there if they had a question. Just things of that nature. Um, one other sort of space, one other sort of service is the building as a service, space as a service. A lot of libraries, unlike the old days, have a little more space flexibility now because we have fewer staff, cancel a lot of things, we've gone, we've got rid of a lot of print to rely on E. So uh, many libraries don't have the space crunch that they used to, and so um, you know, and so libraries are. Um, you know, using the at the new space for, for different purposes. You know, some of that space is obviously going back to a larger law school for offices and classrooms, but then many libraries are using the space for sort of non-traditional library purposes, like cafes, group study rooms, um, collaboration tech rooms, so like places where students could self-serve and um, to to take themselves to practice for like moot courts and job interviews, um, things of that nature. Um, one uh, worship meditation space, one that I thought was really interesting is that SUNY Buffalo now has a passport acceptance facility in their law library, um, which apparently uh, is really helpful to the students who need their picture taken for all sorts of IDs and visas and, and all sorts of things. Um, and then sort of more on the sort of outreachy spectrum, uh, social media, you know, that's, that's a promotion outreach thing, but it's a way to send out information too, remind everybody that you're there. Um, marketing specific things like posters and handouts, um, handing out the, the doodads, uh, you know, whenever they use the sticky notes with your logo on it, oh, the library, yeah, they're nice people. Um, you know, that's why Lexis and Westlaw have been doing that, you know, forever. <laughs> Just because, you know, to help you, you know, oh yeah, I should look that up on Westlaw. Um, because there is a constant need to remind patrons not just what you can do for them, but what you've already done for them. Um, we had our ABA accreditation review this last, in 2014. Um, and so, on the library team, was interviewing this faculty member who's young, writes a lot, uses our services all the time, and she asked him, oh, so what do you think of the library? Well, I, I don't really use the library that much. Um, do you, so do you use Lexis Westlaw Hine online? Oh yeah, yeah, I use those. Do you use the faculty services or the phone page? That's our anachronistic name for the document delivery service. Oh yeah, I use those all the time. I use them you know, every week. Oh, actually, I guess the library, the library's great. They're doing a really nice job. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he wasn't just going to come up with that. Just, you know, point blank. Uh, my third trend was talking about changing collection development issues. 
I'm going to skip over that one because I think that I'm running them short of time. And I think everybody's talked. Not today, but there's a lot I have to remember. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to talk about was the library's involvement with providing students with practical skills. Because that's, you know, from the, the law firm perspective, that's sort of a big one. Um, you know, there's the revised standards uh, from the ABA this year. Uh, an increased focus on professional skills, increased focus on legal analysis and reasoning, legal research, problem solving, and written and oral communication in a legal context. That's a, that's a quote. And an increased focus on assessment of student learning. Um, libraries have always participated in that. Uh, you know, that's always been one of one of our big services and, and big foci, foci? focuses. Um, and so things like advanced legal research, uh, more and more libraries are getting involved in first year legal uh, skills instruction. Um, and But it's no longer the, the treasure hunts that I remember from when I was in law school. Um, the, the problems are real life fact scenarios so that you can analyze, I'm, I'm out of time, so that we can, so that the students need to analyze the prop, the facts, research the law, reanalyze, uh, you know, the iterative process that is legal research. Um, and so that's, you know, very much the, the focus of the, of the law libraries now. Um, a renewed focus on cost effectiveness and efficiency, because as everybody knows, time is money. It's not just about, you know, how many hours you're on Lexus anymore, but, you know, there's, there's more to it than that. Um, and legal research especially lends itself to uh, the outcomes-based education approach because, you know, you have a lot of assignments to do various legal research problems, so there's sort of a constant evaluation of the students um, going through. Um, um, and then, you know, one other thing is that uh, the libraries are more and more involved in teaching uh, technological tools and policies, so the like, benefits and risks of using things like cloud computing, client management software, how to use those things. Um, and then, you know, there's the constant grapple with research in different formats. Um, every, you know, every law student's preference is to use, you know, the E version. But I assigned a tax, pro a tax research problem this year. Um, which they loved. Um, they, they didn't really. Um, but, you know, so, but one thing that the studies have shown is that you absorb things a lot better in print than you ever will on a screen. And with some of those text code sections, as you all know, if you print them out, they'd be like 60 pages. Um, and so for my problem, everything was in section F, but there was like F, F1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so they found the stuff in one, and they some of them, and they mostly found the stuff in two. Some of them found the stuff in four, but then section six was where the, the inflation adjustment provision was, you know, and about half of them found that. Um, and so, you know, and so that's, you know, that's the trick and the sort of the focus that that we're working on these days, is because you know, print. When they go to the law firm, they're probably not going to use the print either. Um, and, but it's about teaching them how to teach in an online, in an online um, environment, uh, you know, so that they they don't miss the things that they're, you know, that they're missing now. And so I guess that was sort of a whirlwind, lots of challenges, but I guess we'll open it up for questions now. Yeah, thank you, June and KC. <laughs> we have uh, time for maybe eight to ten minutes of questions. Who wants to be the first one? Uh, go ahead. Um, do the attorneys at your firm do use the physical library anymore? I mean, and, and has it decreased to some degree because you're talking about space and location, and, and from what I've seen at private firms, uh, a lot of libraries are being eliminated, um, and those that exist, it's sort of like a museum that we use. Uh, could you? So the question is, do the attorneys at my firm use the library? Uh, I guess the answer would be the library physical space. Yeah. And I guess it depends on who you ask. 
me personally, I've never really seen anybody in there. Maybe a handful of times. And in fact, the one time I did see you guys sitting at a table, I actually stopped in my tracks and I went over to him and I said, so I'm just curious. You must have thought I was a psycho because I did. I forgot to introduce myself. I said, so I'm just curious. Why are you sitting here? <laughs> and he's like, well, it's because I knew these books and librarians told me and you had these and so I just came up here and looked. I was like, oh, that's that's great. And I'm looking at what he's looking at and it's like, oh, well, you know this book. Um, if you look at the date, it's 1980 something. I'm guessing there's something more recent online. And he's like, oh. And then the other one is like some sort of treatise. I'm like, oh, this one's from 1960. <laughs> might be a newer one. So, you know, yes, I probably scared him to death. He'll never come back. But, <laughs> because my point is, I don't really see a lot of people using it. And what I've seen is, I think, as, as um, in, and what we'll probably do is we have a lot more space in one in our headquarters office. We have a lot of compact shelving. So I'm probably going to centralize the collection to that. So anything we have to keep, um, like old dictionaries, um, we have a big IP practice, we'll probably keep in that location anything else. Uh, the other locations, as um, my boss goes around renovating stuff, he keeps taking out the library. So the libraries are now literally in, in two of our locations now, just bookcases in the corners um, on every floor. So, you know, I've completely given up on the idea of barcoding these things. We no longer track them. I mean, it's just, there's no point. Um, there's just not, not any value. Again, it's not value add. Right? Do I really need to know exactly where this book is? Probably not. Unless it's updated, and then I'm actually going back and saying, you know, you've had this for a while. You realize there's a giant stack of updates um, back in the mailroom. You sure you're still practicing good luck? <laughs> um, so it's a conversation that we're having. We, no, I don't really see anybody. So that's why we're trying to find other, I don't know what I'm sorry, I'm talking away, but that's why we're trying to find other uses for the space, right? I don't want to end up in Siberia. I think there's real value to having that library and interaction. Like I'm doing, you know, talking to people one-on-one, -on -one. there's serendipity of somebody coming in and saying, hi, how are you doing? Um, I send my librarians out to deliver uh, results sometimes. You know, it's like, hey, don't just let the book sit on the, the bookcase. Deliver the book in, you know, personally and say, hey, I'm the librarian. Um, how can I help you? Is there anything else you need? Is this all you need? So um, where I am trying to get some, some traction, though, is, for example, collaborative space. So this is something other law schools are doing, this idea of group work. Um, the law firms are doing a lot of this. I'm seeing some of it go into other locations. Um, I would love to host um, a big work group area in the library because they're doing stuff that we know things about that we can help them with. IT doesn't want to support it. We can sort of serve that middle ground. Um, another librarian I know um, at another big firm with one of theirs, they, they uh, created, they put the library in a central hallway. Not a hallway, but like a really centralized location so that everybody had to walk through. And um, with that, um, they also started, the idea was, well, maybe we could pull in the IT help desk or, you know, the whatever help desk and put everybody in that same space. You put the coffee machine there. Um, he, he said he actually went out and bought this gigantic, fancy coffee cappuccino latte thing <laughs> um, because he wanted to draw people in. And I, I love that idea. So we're working on that. Any other questions? Oh, very good. Good evening. Have a mic. Uh, this might be a little bit strange of a question, but one thing we've, we've seen at the reference desk uh, is that as we are in this sort of ugly transition period between print materials and electronic materials, uh, people want the electronic materials, but they have intuitive, they have an intuitive sense of what KC mentioned, which is that they retain information better when they read it in print. So I find that people will come up to the reference desk and say, I need this treatise. And we say, well, we have the one from 1840 in print, or we can print, you know, you can access the newest one in Westlaw. And they say, sure, we'll print out all 400 pages for me. <laughs> and I wonder if, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a firm environment, when you're really watching the dollars, and where nobody seems to be coming in 
I, I wonder if you track people's printing of the electronic documents to see how that's actually impacting your bottom line. Well, um, so again, topic of great interest to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my, my, my pet theory on all this and why people don't like electronics. So I think that it's just a matter of time before we have giant you know, Kindle things that are just as good as paper. It's just a matter of time. Um, and we're almost there. So that, I don't, I think it's, that is just a, a technology issue that's, that's being fixed. Where I think there's a really big issue where the resistance that I see is that one screen is not enough, right? So with a book, you can have 10 books open and you can be working simultaneously in all 10 books, but with a computer, you have one screen. Um, it's just not enough. You know, I found myself in my hotel room, I have my laptop open, I have my iPad open to another page, but I have to reference the email, so I've got my smartphone, I have three screens going, and it wasn't enough. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a screen space issue. So you know, one of, one of the issues I've been trying to sell my boss on this idea is that why not put in the library a giant interactive table? These things are only like ten thousand dollars. Giant interactive <laughs> table, and that way people can open up multiple books at the same time, and then they can really work with them the way they would with print. So I don't think it's the I don't think it's the whole holding paper and turning it. Um, I don't think that's what it is. I really think it's about space, uh, visual space. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. But <laughs> okay, it's uh, 11.50. I think we should give them another round of applause. So um, we're going to break for lunch now. Hopefully by now the... the